Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover 2024. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside Dave Vellante, my co-host and co-analyst for this event. I would like to welcome back to the show Dave Russell. He is the Senior Vice President, Head of Strategy at Veeam. Thank you so much for being such a good friend of theCUBE. It's great to be back. And Emily Tejas, she is the Senior Technologist at Veeam. Welcome to theCUBE, Emily, your first Thank time. Thank you, it's my Very first exciting. time. Very green, excited to be green, here. The green yeah. Veeam. The color, I love Veeam's colors. Color of money, it is. <laughs> color of Celtics, right? Yeah, Just had to get that in. Yes, yes. Yeah, how, how about the Boston Celtics? Just, yeah, yeah exactly. These guys don't once every 18 years. These guys years. are West Coast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was a Celtics fan actually for this one, because oh. we were just talking off camera about Arizona, right? So I'm a Phoenix Suns fan, live in Colorado oh, wow, now, so okay. I'm a Denver fan too. Hey, if someone's going to beat those two teams, then I'm all about the East. All right. Well, there you go. You're just buttering us up. No, it's true. <laughs> so, Dave, I want to start with you because a, re a recurring theme that we're talking a lot here on the Cube today is this ongoing battle against ransomware. I would love you to really give our viewers the lay of the land in terms of of, of confronting the threat and and really what what companies are are up against right now. Yeah, well, I don't want to be too much of an alarmist, but it's not a good news story. And everything that you read about in terms of concern, in terms of increase, the rise is true. Two weeks ago, we came out with our third ransomware trends report, not of Veeam customers, but of the whole industry. So 1,200 organizations that were hit with ransomware, not just 1,200 organizations, but they actually had to have suffered a cyber attack in the last 12 months. So if we double click on that, to your point, what are people up against? It's getting worse, meaning the variant of attacks is increasing, the number of people that respond that, hey, people are going after my backup repositories, my safety net, if you will, is increasing, and cyber insurance coverage is essentially decreasing. So again, not to try to be an alarmist, but the odds are not in your favor. We're in Vegas. If you're a betting person, don't bet against cyber, plan for cyber. You know, I was watching, whenever the, um the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting was a couple weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago. And somebody in the audience asked Ajit Jain, who's like one of Warren's you know, successors, what they thought about cyber insurance. And because they're obviously heavily into the insurance business, and he was like, we hate it. It's too unpredictable yeah. and we don't like it. Now, of course, the whole industry, we know, this, this bubbled up, there's been a lot of action in, modern type of insurance companies coming up. But the fact that you know, one of the savviest investors in the planet is saying, I don't want to touch it, said to me, wow, the, the, the world needs technology help yeah. you know, in process and you know, people and training. What do you yeah. think about that? that was, I was shocked to hear him say that. Uh, yeah, but I can see why, yeah. because now we're going on two years in a row when we've asked specific cyber insurance questions and unfortunately, it's a case of where the premiums go up, the coverage decreases, and it's like eating at a restaurant. We were just talking about food before we went on the air, right? And if you go and have a bad meal, the remediation plan isn't really going to make you whole, right? You still have an outage. Uh, on average, the outage is 3.4 weeks, so you're approaching almost a month. That's on average. So you know, again, if you're a glass half full person, maybe you can beat that. If you're more of a realist, maybe you're not, it's going to be a month or more. So now let's say that we're collectively, the four of us in the insurance business, how do we play something that's hugely random, that literally doesn't discriminate against any company, any geography, you name it? So, the, the, first of all, I love this study, and I haven't dug into this year's uh, uh, study, but first of all, you get organizations that have been attacked in the last 12 months, specifically ransomware attack or or, yes, okay, so that's not easy to find. So that's 1,200, I mean, that's a, that's a big number. So age old question is, do you, I know I've asked you this before, I know what's coming, do you pay the ransom, <laughs> right? Uh, well, you shouldn't pay the ransom, right? <laughs> but yeah, we even asked that question too for customers, you know, which were the ones that actually did end up paying the ransom and actually it was really staggering because the customers that did pay the ransom still didn't even get their data back. So you can't count on paying the ransom, right? You have to count on having a strategy, having an incident response strategy, you have to practice for it so that way you know what you, what you need to do when that actual you know, issue strikes because what we're finding 
thing is, and we actually, you know, two weeks ago, we just came off of VeeamOn, we had a, a VIP session where we brought all of our top customers in and we walked them through an incident response workshop. You know, so we got them all together and we gave them the opportunity to go through what does it look like when you're hit by ransomware, right? From a blackout. You have no communications, you have no email, you have no access to phones, what are your steps? And it was staggering to watch some people say, actually, you know what, we haven't gone through this exercise before and we really need to be, you know, straightening up and tightening up what we need to do because practice is only going to help us in the long run. So what is that? Is that willful ignorance? Or is, is, that an un, is that a real lack of understanding of what's going on? Why are enterprises so um, numb to this very real and very expensive threat? I think part of it is, you know, a hope that it won't happen to me. We're not a very interesting company or target, you know, like a, a Sony that was very much directed at a company. But this is oftentimes a crime of opportunity. I'm sure there absolutely are targeted attacks, but that's part of it. The other part of it is people are very, very busy. They're, you know, there's a reason that they haven't patched known vulnerabilities. They're going on two years old. Unfortunately, that's also one of the greatest attack vectors. Yeah, so, I, that when I was laughing saying I know what's coming because the answer is don't, don't be in that situation. Right. So when you were describing, Emily, the, the, um, the process that you guys went through with customers, what was going through my mind is like the cloud guys are really good at securing their infrastructure. They're better than 99% of the, the companies out there. Is it similar for you guys as, as data protection experts where you actually have the expertise and, and you know the processes, you know the technology intimately, you obviously know your technologies. Did it necessitate and sort of an all Veeam approach? Well, Veeam isn't everything. You don't sell you know, compute and storage. Right. And, right, and so obviously you have to interconnect to those. You've got to integrate with companies like, like HPE. So I'm curious as to what those conversations were like. Yeah. Um, and if you could share, that'd be great. Absolutely, I, I mean, like, so HP is a perfect example, right? We've had this relationship for over 10 years now, mm. and I think the biggest, the biggest benefit is that our two companies work strongly together to help customers, specifically when it comes to ransomware and to having better security uh, practices put in place, right? So even take their HP Electra line, you know, so Veeam integrates from that, from a production storage to backup targets, to leveraging catalysts and immutability. So it's, it's taking all the best practices that every customer should be leveraging, which is a three, two, one, one zero, which we add the extra two for the backup zip code for all of our customers to be following as a basic strategy of getting data off site, making sure it's being checked to ensure you're not going to have any type of you know, corruption and you're not going to have any vulnerabilities or things like that. Um, but then working with someone like HP to help fulfill that from a, from a storage perspective, right? Because they're going to be able to help make it easier for our customers to be able to flip a switch and have that immutability and have that um, access to ensure that no backups are going to be uh, deletable or anything like that. So um, I think the biggest benefit is just A, coming up with the number one, a strategy, and then following with some of these technology vendors that are partnering coupled together to ensure that customers can have a, a better outlook, right, and a, and a better plan of attack when yeah. the attack hits them. Explain for the audience the 3210 best practice. Sure, yeah, so, so it's three copies of data, two different types of media, one being kept off site, preferably air gapped or immutable, and then uh, on top of that, right, you're going to be ensuring that uh, that one is, you're going to get a zero, which means zero errors, you're, right, you're checking, you're testing, you're verifying that your backups are going to be recoverable when you need it the most. Um, and I think that's one thing that we see customers really struggle with is backup is easy, the recovery process, are we testing, are we validating, are we doing true testing and not just, hey, I recovered a file because somebody put in a help desk ticket and we're going to call that our, our test for the year, right? It's, it's true testing of orchestration and disaster recovery to ensure you have a full business continuity plan. And, and the media still includes tape? 
It does still include tape, yeah. It, that's part of the ransomware trends report as well. So there's an onward, forward-looking approach as to what are you doing now to harden your infrastructure and be better prepared against ransomware. And you know, we have customers that are responding saying we're leveraging tape to give us a true air gap solution. So, absolutely. And, and this is really part of the strategy of radical resiliency. Can you describe, Emily, how you see this evolving uh, as the threat landscape evolves along with it too. Absolutely, yeah, so, so for us, right, data is everything for customers, right? That's going to help produce their overall outcomes, that's what's going to drive their business forward, so they need to have a good strategy, they need to be able to have data freedom to be able to move that data wherever they see fit, they need to ensure that it's going to be secure. Um, they're also going to have to ensure that from a security perspective, right, that they're able to follow all the best practices, right? Um, um, to Dave's point, right, it's an equal opportunity from a ransomware perspective or a cyber threat. It's, it's out there for, for anybody. So we really have to be better prepared and put some better practices in place. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that with customers is to help them practice and ensure that they have a good strategy. Speaking of strategy, what, what is Veeam today? Backup, recovery, data protection, data management, security, all the above. How, how do you describe Veeam today from a strategy standpoint? Yeah, I used to say for the last few years we're unapologetically a backup company. Backup is maybe not a word that the marketing departments and those types get excited not that about. Sexy. It yeah. doesn't sound that exciting, but let's face it, we've all lost data in our personal lives, probably in our professional lives, and that's on a good day, right, before some of the cyber things that we've just spoken about. I would fundamentally say we're in the data management, data resiliency business. So first and foremost, all the things that we're used to worrying about, meaning network errors, the, the water pipe breaking, those things still happen, and we've got data to back that up. And then you add cyber on top of that. So that's a bit of you know, issue avoidance or issue remediation, but then you've got something more aspirational. What can I do with this data from an AI perspective? How can I go and mine a non-production copy of my, my data, maybe my large language model is but one example. So that's why I put us in the data resiliency camp, but really in the data management camp. Was there any big surprise in this year's study? Um, I, I think a lot of the times you, you, you see a progression in a time series. Was there anything that jumped out you said, wait a minute, that is really surprising. I need to dig in, you dig into the data and you say, wow, this is actually really accurate. Anything that like freaked you out? I'll give you one example. Um, you know, Emily had a good point, which is 23% you know, said we paid the ransom and still didn't, didn't get the data back. But we saw that trend last year. The worst you know, to freak out moment that to you, what you said, Dave, is when we asked people, but what did you do to make sure you were clean prior to getting into production? The number of people was staggering. About three out of four essentially just said, we bring it back to production and then monitor it test it, keep an eye on it. Like, what are you keeping an eye on? At the moment you have an indication, you've been infected, right? Less than a quarter said we're going to sandbox that, put it in a controlled state prior to reintroducing it into production. That actually was hugely surprising and not in a good way. Yeah, because that is really rolling the dice. It's like, yeah. hugely. Let's hope it works. The, <laughs> we actually asked specifically, one of the responses was, are you going to put it in production and monitor it closely? And that got better than one out of four respondents. So that's like saying I'm going to put my hand on the stove, but as soon as it feels really hot, I'll remove it. But you've already experienced the incident. Yeah. Well, exactly, and Dave and Emily, Dave, you're, you're head of strategy, Emily, you're a senior technologist. So much of what you're describing really, really seems like it's a mindset shift that you have to work with customers to really change how they view this and, and how the, the kind of practices that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is that kind of, I mean, is it change management? I mean, it really is a whole different thought process that's required. Absolutely, so usually where I start with, with when I'm having conversations with customers or partners, it's all about people process technology, right? Those are the three things that we can, uh, we can all agree on is that that's what the customer needs to be thinking about, especially when it comes to incident response, right? So who are the people? 
who are the ones that are going to be working on the systems? Are your people in the right mental mindset, right? Because when usually when you get hit by ransomware or some type of threat, it doesn't happen in a, a, on a Monday, right? It happens usually going into Christmas Eve, going into a long weekend. It's done so by, by design. So the people that you're going to be working with that you're going to have to count on to bring your data back, right? What does that look like for them? Do you have enough on-site or or boots on the ground help in order to get you through that process. And you know what we probably are seeing is those that don't have the help are the ones that are just moving forward with let's just recover it inside of that environment and let's just watch it, right? Because they don't have either the people or the capacity to really stand it up and start and sandboxing and testing and ensuring that that data is clean. And that's where it comes down to the process and the technology where we talk to customers about, okay, this is why you need to have a process in place. This is why you need to know all the technology that you have available to you to ensure that you're not just reinfecting yourself because then, to Dave's point, three and a half weeks of, of business, of being down and out, um, if you are doing that more than once a year for customers, right, then at the end of the day, they might not be in business for very long. Okay, so I'm a customer, I'm sufficiently now engaged. You've scared <laughs> We're me. scared, sorry. Right, okay. <laughs> yes. And I want to really address this problem, and I want to understand how you can work with HPE, because they get a strong services organization, that's not what you're known for. You're a product company, just works. Um, take me through a typical customer in, engagement, starting with kind of, you know, the overall sort of assessment, and what role you guys play, and what role HPE plays, all the way through solution. Yeah, so you know, as you say, I mean, we're software only. We're a pure play software organization, HPE, greatest infrastructure provider on the planet. Literally centuries of engineering years they put into everything you can imagine, tape, disc, flash, et cetera. So leveraging a great foundation in terms of where you're going to protect your data on the production system, on the secondary systems, multiple copies to Emily's point, different types of technology, tape, flash, cloud, spinning disk, of course. So also, what we really want to do, because I feel like we've really kind of focused on the scared straight notion to your <laughs> point, right? But what's the good news? The good news is we can now have a greater appreciation of where are the vulnerabilities, where are the escapes, to Emily's point about, okay, if everyone's busy and not able to always do everything that they know they should, how can we automate that in the software? How could we leverage hardware-enabled immutability or encryption or data movement and speed to be able to take advantage of things that just a few years ago wouldn't have been possible. So a big part of it is trying to reduce the friction between daily best practices and the reality of what's going on. If you're, if budget's not an issue, it always is, but let's, let's take finances out of the equation. And I'm in a, let's say below average uh, posture. Can you get me to where I need to be um, inside of 12 months, inside of six months even? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the biggest benefit, and you know, for me, actually, before joining product strategy, I worked primarily with public sector customers, right? Who didn't have the best budget, didn't have a lot of people that was built inside their IT organization, and that you usually were waiting one, two years in order for a new budget cycle to come in, right? right. So, so it was working with those types of customers to really help them to get on the right path of having a better data protection strategy and partnering with HPE and, and giving them opportunities like leveraging HPE GreenLake so that way they can do a purchase as you go and be able to still get the best of both products and both vendors um, without having to you know, go and scramble to, to try to find budget for those. Okay, so, so we're ending on a happy note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. Thanks guys. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante and John Furrier. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.